Some trust in chariots. We trust in the name of the Lord our God. Some trust in horses. We trust in the name of the Lord our God. We trust in the name of the Lord our God. We trust in the name of the Lord our God. His love never fails. His name will always prevail. We trust in the name of the Lord our God. Some trust in the work they do. We trust in the name of the Lord our God. By His grace all the work is through. We trust in the name of the Lord our God. We trust in the name of the Lord our God. We trust in the name of the Lord our God. His love never fails. His name will always prevail. We trust in the name of the Lord our God. Oh, glory to the name, the name of our salvation. Oh, glory to the name above all names, the name of the Lord our God. Some trust in the wealth of things. We trust in the name of the Lord our God. Name with more. We trust in the name of the Lord our God. We trust in the name of the Lord our God. We trust in the name of the Lord our God. His love never fails. His name will always prevail. We trust in the name of the Lord our We trust in the name of the Lord our We trust in the name of the Lord our God. Hey, good morning. Welcome to Twickenham. Really glad to have you here. If you are a guest, thanks for coming out to be with us today. And if you're a guest online, thank you for joining us as well. Uh, I know a lot of our folks are out of town, and uh, the, the people that could afford the gas, those of us who couldn't, stayed home. So glad you're here. Um, wanna, uh, first of all, I want to welcome our, our, intern, our youth interns for the summer. Uh, we have Rawson Brooks and Allie Northcutt. Can you guys stand and give them a hand? Welcome here. They will be working with our teens this summer, and uh, of course, Allie's ours. She grew up here, so we kind of like to see that happen. That's good news, to watch one of our own grow up, and Rawson's okay, just okay. So, it is Memorial Day weekend. This is the weekend that we think about the sacrifices that have been made for us and our, 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 our children, our, our future. Uh, there are about 25 different places in the country that claim to have started Memorial Day, which I think is kind of interesting, and I don't think there's any animosity between those. They just think it was theirs that started first, which tells you that we think it's pretty important to remember. And so we, of course, remember the men and women who gave their lives in service to this country. But today we gather to remember something even more important, the one who gave his life for all of us, for all eternity, Jesus. We'll be thinking about that in, uh, all, all through our service, but specifically when we come to our communion time in service. Steve Clark will come up here in a little while after we sing a little bit and share with us a scripture and some thoughts and a prayer about communion, the Lord's Supper, the Eucharist. I don't know what they call it in your church or if they call it anything at all, but there's a packet that you should have picked up on your way in, a little plastic packet with the self-contained communion set. If you didn't pick one of those up, you can step out in the lobbies uh, during one of the songs and, and pick one up. Um, there is a card on the seat in front of you. You can turn on your camera and open up that uh, QR code it'll, and then click the links. It'll take you to various information about our church and you can sign up and let us know that you were here. Or you can write it, hand write it on one of the cards uh, in, the, in the lobbies and stick it in the mailbox. Just thank you for being here. Glad you're here. Brad is leading our singing this morning. Lincoln, our normal worship leader, is in Texas for graduation. So we have Brad and glad to have Brad. Let's stand. Let's worship the Lord. Y'all are going to know these, so sing them out, all right? This world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. The treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. 
The angels beckon me from heaven's open door And I can't feel at home in this world anymore Oh Lord, you know I have no friend like you If heaven's not my home, then Lord, what will I do? The angels beckon me from heaven's open door And I can't feel at home in this world anymore Just up in glory land we'll live eternally The saints on every hand are shouting victory Their song the sweetest praise drifts back from heaven's shore And I can't feel at home in this world anymore Oh Lord, you know I have no friend like you If heaven's not my home, then Lord, what will I do? The angels beckon me from heaven's open door And I can't feel at home in this world anymore I'm in the way, the bright and shining way I'm in the glory land, way and way Telling the world that Jesus saves today Yes, I'm in the glory land, glory land way in his love I'm in the glory land glory land way till I shall see him in that home above I'm in the glory land glory land way I'm in the glory land glory land way I'm in the glory land glory land way heaven is nearer and the way grows this morning uh, from Matthew chapter 6. No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food? and the body more than clothes. Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any one of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? Let's be seated as we prepare for communion. I just want to be where you are. Dwelling daily in your presence I don't want to worship from afar Draw me near to where you are I just want to be where you are In your dwelling place forever Take me to the place where you are I just want to be with you. I want to be where you are, dwelling in your presence, feasting at your table, surrounded by your glory in your presence. That's where I always want to be. I just want to be, I just want to be with you. Good morning. Today I'd uh, like us to spend a second just to think about what would you do if you knew this was uh, your last day? 
The Bible tells us that Jesus eagerly desired to spend time with his disciples and to uh, have Passover with them. He, of course, instituted the Lord's Supper. He washed their feet. He uh, gave them a new commandment. Uh, he said to love one another. He also promised to give his spirit as, as their comforter. He said that they would have sorrow that would turn to joy. They would also have suffering uh, that would eventually lead to peace. I wonder if we know anybody in our midst or in our community that is going undergoing sorrow and suffering today and that we can be mindful of. But then Jesus prayed for them. Uh, after he gave them a lot of uh, discussion, he prayed uh, in their midst. He prayed for himself, then he prayed for his disciples. And in John 17, verse 13, he says, Now I'm coming to you, and I speak these things in the world, so that they may have my joy completed in them. I have given them your word. The world hated them because they are not of the world, as I am not of the world. I'm not praying that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. They are not of the world as I'm not of the world. Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. I sanctify myself for them so that they may also be sanctified by the truth. I pray not only for these, but for all those who believe me through their message, May they all be one as you, Father, are in me and I'm in you. May they also be one in us so that the world may believe that you sent me. I have given them the glory you have given me. May they be one as we are one. I am in them and you are in me. May they be made completely one so that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them as you love me. Let's pray as we take the bread. Lord, we just come to you today and uh, give you so much praise and thanks for Jesus who spent his last time on earth just uh, praying over his disciples and praying over us, Lord, who uh, have believed their message. And Father, we uh, take great comfort in the fact that Jesus has taken time to pray for us to you. And Lord, we pray for uh, us to be set apart, to be sanctified by the truth of his love and the truth of, uh, that you've given us. And Father, we just pray that we realize uh, what that means, Lord, to be set apart for your purposes. And also, Lord, uh, we pray that we can be one, that we can love one another, that we can realize that uh, our sorrow and, and the sorrow of our neighbors and friends can be turned to joy and our suffering will eventually be turned to peace, Lord, in you. Help us to be one with each other and also one in you. And Father, help us as we encourage one another and that they may see um, you in us and because of the love that you have for us and for them. We give you all praise and thank you now for this body the, that's been broken for us, your body, and this body. Um, bread that we can take to remember that. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. As your children gather in peace, all the angels sing in heaven. In your temple, all that I see is to glimpse your holy presence. All the Hold 
Father, we're so grateful for this reminder that it was love that saved the world. We pray, Father, we are, we are thankful, Father, for the blood that gives us the freedom to spread that love. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All the angels exalt you on high. What a kingdom to depart. But you left your throne in the sky just to live inside my heart. All the heavens cannot Hold you, Lord, how much less to dwell in thee. I can only make my one desire, holding on to thee all the heavens cannot hold you, Lord, how much less to dwell in me, I can only make my one desire, holding on to Thee. Blessing and honor, glory and power, be to the ancient of days. From every nation, all of creation, bow before the ancient of days. Every tongue in heaven and earth shall declare your glory. Every knee shall bow at your throne. In worship you will be exalted, O God. And your kingdom shall not pass away, O ancient of days. Blessing and honor, glory and power be to the ancient of days. From every nation, all of creation, bow before the ancient of days. Every tongue in heaven and earth shall declare your glory. Every knee shall bow at your throne. In worship you will be exalted, O God. And your kingdom shall not pass away, O ancient of days. Your kingdom shall reign over all the earth. Sing to the ancient of days, for none can compare to your matchless worth. Sing to the ancient of days, your kingdom shall reign over all the earth. Sing to the ancient of days, for none can compare to your matchless worth. Sing to the ancient of days, every tongue in heaven and earth shall declare your glory, every knee shall bow at your throne. In worship you will be exalted, O God, and your kingdom shall not pass away. O ancient of days, O ancient of days, O ancient of days, O ancient of days, O ancient of days. Be seated, please. So last week, most of us had never heard of Uvalde, Texas, or Robb Elementary School. And now we 
pretty much wish we still hadn't heard of it. I cannot begin to imagine the pain, the grief that the families and friends and colleagues of those students and children and teachers are going through. See, an, atro an atrocity of that magnitude becomes a part of, of their stories forever and ours. There may once have been a time when evil carried out in a distant place didn't touch us, but in a connected world, all of that distance has been collapsed. Technology has made us next door neighbors to everybody. And our neighborhood is poorer than it was a week ago. So let's go to God in prayer for that town, those children and their families. Let's bow together. God who remembers our sins no more, but never forgets our names. We commend to your grace, McKenna, Layla, Miranda, Nevia, Jose, Javier, Tess, Rogelio, Ellie, Eliana, Annabelle, Jackie, Zaya, Hache, Mate, Halia, Amory, Lexi, and Alithia, and their teachers, Irma and Ava. Sovereign God, you watch our ways and weave out of terrible events wonders of goodness and grace, but we confess the valley we are in is too low and too dark for us to see how anything good could come from this. We believe. Help us in our unbelief. God of compassion, surround those who have been shaken by this atrocity with your love. Calm the fears of children. And though parents are lost in grief, find them and comfort them. Empower our leaders at all levels to think with one mind and speak with one voice. Deliver them from the temptation to seek political advantage from this outbreak of evil. God all-knowing, give all of us the wisdom to hold our tongues, to be <coughs> quick to listen and slow to speak. Take away our arrogance and hatred. Break down the walls that separate us. Unite us in the bonds of love. Mighty God, in Jesus, you dealt with spirits that darken minds and set people against themselves. Give peace to those among us who are torn by internal conflict and dream, and dream deceiving and violent dreams. Tame the unruly forces among us and within us that we may, may live quiet and peaceful lives in all holiness. God of power, protect our children, your children, each made in your image and likeness, each one knit together in their mother's wombs, endowed with unique gifts and personalities, each one invested with inerrant worth, value, and dignity. Protect them. Deliver them from any threat the evil one can imagine, whether he seeks to injure their bodies, deceive their minds, ruin their relationships, or shipwreck their souls. God of peace, let our gentleness be evident to all. Help us release our anxieties and turn to you. May your peace guard our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. I hope that you will be gentle with people in your world this week. We need some gentleness right now. We are going to be in uh, 1 John. If you want to open or turn on your Bibles to that, that's toward the end of the New Testament, uh, just a few books shy of Revelation. Um, I really enjoy history. 
especially World War II history. And last week I was reading about the last gasps of the Third Reich and, and specifically about one of its most important and powerful leaders, Heinrich Himmler. Himmler was head of uh, Hitler's Gestapo, chief of the SS, commander-in-chief of the Home Army, supreme police chief, head of all espionage and counterintelligence, both home and abroad, uh, minister of the interior, and the architect of the final solution, uh, the concentration camp system. Uh, other than Hitler himself, no one enjoyed as much power as Himmler. His, his cold-blooded orders sent millions of men, women, and children to their deaths. As bad as things are now, and as bad as they have been this week, just dipping your toe in a little bit of history makes you realize things have been much, much worse. After his demise, those who knew Himmler testified that there was little evidence that he was a sadist or, or that he enjoyed mass murder, he, they said that he just believed in the ideology of the Nordic master race. That vision just consumed him until early 1945. That's when the Reich was being squeezed from the West by the British and American forces and from the East by the Russians, and Himmler betrayed Hitler. He made peace overtures to the Western allies, uh, the British, and he proposed a conditional surrender that would leave part of northern Germany unoccupied so that he could set up a new government, and naturally, he was going to be the head. And the allies responded with a categorical no, and then Hitler found out about it uh, when he heard it on a BBC broadcast. And he flew into a rage and rewrote his political last will, cutting Himmler out of it and naming Admiral Karl Donitz to be his successor. Still, Himmler just couldn't believe it. His, his deepest desire, his greatest passion was to see Germany survive and rise from the ashes with him at its leader, even as the regime was crumbling down around him. He, he believed, he indulged that illusion. It was like the country was burning and he was making plans for dinner. He paraded around northern Germany with dozens of SS escorts and a long procession of black cars with all the pomp and importance of a man who had great power when he had none. And then when Hitler committed suicide, Grand Admiral Karl Donitz, who'd formerly been in charge of the submarine corps, became head of state. He served 20 days. That's how long he was head of the German state, for 20 days. And then he issued Germany's unconditional surrender. And then he sent Himmler a letter telling him that Hitler was dead and that Himmler's services were no longer required. He wrote, I now regard all your offices as abolished. Despite overwhelming evidence to the contrary, Himmler still didn't believe it was over. He still acted like he had a lot of power. He still acted like that, that everything was going to be okay. That dream of the thousand-year Reich just possessed him. Even after he was captured by the British, he remained arrogant, entitled, demanding and insolent. Then finally he died by suicide when he realized none of it was going to happen. And he was buried in an unmarked grave that only four Allied soldiers knew about, and to this day, nobody knows where he's buried. Now, with that story, we're ready to hear 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 through 17. And I'm going to be reading from Eugene Peterson's translation, The Message. Don't love the world's ways. Don't love the world's goods. Love of the world squeezes out love of the Father. Practically everything that goes on in the world, wanting your own way, wanting everything for yourself, wanting to appear important, 
has nothing to do with the Father. It just isolates you from Him. The world and all its wanting, wanting, wanting is on the way out. But whoever does what God wants is set for eternity. You, you may be more familiar with a different translation of those verses. The New International Version, the English Standard Version, and the, the venerable old King James all say, do not love the world or love not the world, which sounds horrible, right? I mean, we're supposed to love the world for God so loved the world. So the, world, the word world is obviously very, very important because it comes up six times in this really short passage. So what does John mean by world? What does he mean when he uses that word? Well, you actually know the Greek word that he uses, especially here in Huntsville. It's cosmos. Um, it, it, in the Bible, it can mean one of three things. It can mean earth, the planet. Um, in Acts chapter 17, Paul goes to Athens, Greece, and he's a little blown away by all the idols that he sees. Uh, in fact, there's an idol to every conceivable God, and there's even one to the unknown God, and he's, it, it just kind of freaks him out a little bit. There's a group of philosophers who hear him preaching, and they say, you know, we would like to hear more of this strange teaching that you're sharing. Why don't you join us at the Areopagus, which was a, a location and the city council. It was na- the city council was named for where it met at the Areopagus. And, and so they brought him over there, and, and Paul begins with sort of a, in his famous Areopagus address, he begins with kind of a backhanded compliment. It's like, I, I see you guys are really religious. You even have an idol to an unknown God. Let me tell you about the unknown God. And then he says, this is Acts 17, 24. He says, the God who made the world and everything in it is Lord of heaven and earth. Paul uses cosmos, and there he's talking about the planet. So the, the word world can mean the planet, or it can refer to the people on the earth. John three sixteen. for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That's not telling us that God loved the planet, although he does. It's telling us that God loves the people on the planet. God loves you and me. So cosmos can refer to planet or people, or it can refer to the values, the systems, the attitudes, the principles, the standards, the ideologies, the habits, the beliefs, the philosophies, the cultures of the world, the way the world works. James 1.27, religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless as this, to look after orphans and widows in their, uh, in their distress, and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. James is not counseling us to avoid ecologically challenged physical environments. He's telling us to avoid spiritually polluting ideas and beliefs and values. That's what John's talking about in 1 John chapter 2, the way the world thinks, the way the, the things the world values, or as the message puts it, the ways of the world. Don't love the world's ways. What does that mean? To love Love the world's ways, ideas, ideologies, philosophies. The, and you all know this, I suspect a lot of you do. The, the Greeks had a lot of different words for love. The one that John uses here is the highest form of love, agape. When, when, when you use the word agape, A-G-A-P-E is how it's spelled in, in using the English letters, when you, when you use the word agape love for, for people, if it's aimed at people, it's talking about unconditional love, love no matter what, love that seeks only what's in the best interests of the person that you love, totally unselfish, wants only the greatest good for another. That's agape love when it's directed at a person. But not only do the Greeks have different words for for different kinds of love, they can take the same word, aim it in a different direction, and the meaning changes. When agape love is used of things, not people, but of things, as it is here in John chapter 2, 1 John 2, it means to take pleasure 
in the thing. I, I, I love tacos. I take pleasure in tacos. It means to, it means to prize it above other things. I don't know that anybody would say I love tacos more than I love everything. Maybe somebody would. But when you aim the word agape at a thing, it means that you're unwilling to abandon that thing. You're unwilling to live without it. Heinrich Himmler loved Nazi ideology. He took pleasure in it. He prized it above all else. He was unwilling to abandon it. He could not live without it. His was a tainted love. Now, it's easy to see why John would tell us not to love an evil ideology like Nazism. A person must be pretty far gone to prize above all else a way of thinking that could result in the Holocaust. But John's church wasn't full of Nazis, and neither is ours. So why does he tell us not to love the world's ways? Three reasons. First, in verse 15, he says, if you love the world's ways, it's going to squeeze out of your heart love for God. You can't love the ways of the world and love God. Remember the definition of agape. Agape love, when it's directed at a thing, to agape love a thing is, or an idea or a way of life or a value system means that you prize it above all else. It means that you are unwilling to abandon it. You cannot imagine life without it. In other words, it becomes your idol. You worship that thing. Toward the end of the first century, when John wrote, the church was beginning to face persecution. The government of Rome saw the church as a threat and sought to eliminate it by force. That would get a lot worse. It wasn't bad in the first century. It gets a lot worse in the second and third centuries. But John's not worried about that here. He, he, he worries about it a little bit in Revelation, but here in, second, in 1 John, he's not worried about it. He's worried about seduction, not persecution. Because if people prize anything more than they prize God, they won't need to be persecuted. They won't threaten the systems or the ideologies or the values or the ways of the world because they have embraced them, they have loved them. John says, I, I want you not to love the world because if you do, it's going to push the love of the Father out of your life. It'll become the most important thing to you. You won't love God. The second reason John wants us, warns us about this tainted love is, is in verse 16. Now, I like Peterson's translation, the one we heard earlier in verse 16, where he talks about wanting your own way and wanting everything for yourself and wanting to appear important. But the New International Version does a better job at getting to the literal meaning of the language. For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life comes not from the Father, not from, not from the Father, but from the world. I don't, I don't want you to love the world, John says. I don't want you to prize it above everything else. I don't want you to be unwilling to abandon it because what's there is not from the Father. Now, the key word in verse 16 is lust, desire, deep, burning passion. And it can be sexual or, or it can be not, not about sex. In fact, John goes on to say there are three ways that desire shows up or manifests itself in, in our lives, three ways that desires can turn good, godly love into tainted love for all the wrong things. Lusts of the flesh. That's not just about sex. It's talking about things that we experience in our bodies, things that we can touch, taste, feel, see, hear. It's an unhealthy desire for physical things, experiences, sensations. It could be focused on possessions or clothes or food or pleasure or sports or money or cars, anything. Uh, it, our, our desire, it's, it's about our desire. It's not... It's not the possessions, it's the obsessions. Our expectation that a thing will satisfy, 
that a thing will do for me what only God can do. Expecting the things of this world to satisfy my deep desires is like dumpster diving outside a fine restaurant when somebody else has invited you to come inside and offer to pick up the tab. That's lust of the flesh. Lust, lust or desire of the eyes is an un, unhealthy focus on the aesthetic. Things that are beautiful and moving and glamorous and attractive and aesthetically pleasing. Literature, music, art, the finer things in life, which may not seem very relevant for you because you probably don't have a fine art collection at your house. I know some of you, you probably have the poker playing dogs hanging up in your rooms. It's not like you've got a gallery and you invite folks over for a small group and you show them the Rembrandt or the nice Gustav Klimt or the Pollock in the lavatory, right? We don't, that's not us, right? A couple of years ago, a Northwestern University professor named Renee Engeln, E-N-G-E-L-N, if you want to look her up, coined a new phrase and wrote a book. Her phrase is beauty sick. The book is Beauty Sick, How the Cultural Obsession with Appearance Hurts Girls and Women. And in a TED Talk, she described what sparked her interest in this. She was, she was teaching in the, at, the, at the Northwestern University, and she had these postgraduate women in, in her class, young women, very smart, pursuing really technical and important stuff, and yet she said their quest to measure up to some cultural standard of beauty seemed to overrule and overwhelm every other goal or interest. They sacrificed time, money, and even their bodies to achieve an arbitrary standard favored by our culture. That's lust of the eyes. And it's not just women and girls. They make t-shirts now for men that make your guns look bigger and your gut looks smaller. I'm not wearing one today. <laughs> and nobody, nobody preens more in the gym in front of the mirrors than 50-year-old men who just started taking testosterone supplements. They just don't. They're really proud. Look, it's not wrong to be in good shape. In fact, there's everything right with being in good shape. And it's not wrong to want to be in good shape. Paul said, for physical training is of some value in 1 Timothy 4. But godliness has value for all things, holding promise for both the present life and the life to come. When the love for looking good or the love for things that look good gets overheated, it becomes an idol that draws us away from God. And then John mentions the pride of life. These are things that make me look big and important, a person to be reckoned with, someone of repute and stature and fame. I, I, I could be proud of my educational achievements. I could be proud of how smart I am. I could be proud of business success or athletic accomplishment or power or position or influence or lots of likes on social media. There are about a million ways that pride works its way into our lives. And again, it's not the things of the world that are bad. It's how we relate to the things. What makes the world a dangerous place is not what's in it. It's not the stuff. It's how we treat the stuff. There's one other reason John warns us about worldly love, and that's verse 17. The world and its desires pass away, but whoever does the will of God lives forever. Now remember, when John's talking about the world, he's not talking about the planet, and he's not talking about the people. He's talking about the ways, the values, the priorities, the systems. So when he, when he talks about the end of the world here, he's, he's not talking about that, that terrifying moment when Gabriel blows his trumpet and the earth and all that's in it is destroyed. He's talking about the ways of the world, its values, systems, attitudes, principles, standards, ideologies, habits, beliefs, philosophies, cultures, ways. John says all of that 
is fading away. It's fading into history, which is where we began this morning, with history. And history proves John right. In the 7th century B.C., 700 years before Jesus, the Assyrians were the dominant political and cultural force in the world. Everything was Assyrian. Everything, almost everything in the inhabited world was, was Assyrian culture and Assyrian values and, and what mattered to Assyrians until they were defeated by the Babylonians. And then everything was Babylonian until the 6th century when the Babylonian culture passed away when the Persians defeated them. And the Persian Empire lasted roughly two centuries until the Greeks, led by Alexander the Great, conquered them. And the Greeks were conquered by the Romans, and the Romans lasted a while, several hundred years. But after Constantine, in the 300s, the empire split. 300 AD, the empire split. And a variety of enemies nibbled away at the Western Empire until it was swallowed up by Germanic invaders. And the Byzantine Empire, the Eastern Empire, part of Rome that was still living fell to the Ottomans, and the Ottomans sided with Germany in World War I, and that didn't work out well for them. Because empires do not last. And even those that blow the curve and manage to stick around for a couple of thousand years experience internal cultural change at astonishing rates. The things that are valued today will be sold at bargain basement prices a year from now. The priorities that, that consume our time and energy now will be considered a waste of time in time. The rules change. Right and wrong swap places. What you sold your soul to gain a year ago, you'll put on a yard sale table in your garage next week. But John says there is one thing that does not have an expiration date. There is one thing that outlasts empires is more enduring than cultural fads. One thing that outlives temporary trends and last minute manias of society looking for the latest and the hottest and the newest and the coolest thing, and that's the will of God. If you and I will love that, if we will take pleasure in it, prize it above other things, be unwilling to abandon it or do without it, we too will last. Otherwise, we're going to be Heinrich Himmler riding around northern Germany acting like all that when his world was burning down around him. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul, all your mind and all your strength and you'll live forever. Let's stand. Let's sing together. This world is not my home. I'm just, just passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. The angels beckon me from heaven's open door. And I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Oh, Lord, you know. If heaven's not my home, then Lord, what will I do? The angels beckon me from heaven's open door, and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Oh, Lord, you know I have no friend like you. If heaven's not my home, then Lord, what will I do? The angels beckon me from heaven's open door, and I can't can't feel at home in this world anymore. Go ahead and be seated. I got some announcements I need to share with you if I can find them. That's not them. So a lot of things are happening, and I have no idea what they are. Here's what I know. In June. Uh, about a dozen of our members are going to be headed down to Ecuador to our uh, mission work down there, Hacienda of Hope. That's a, a home for children who have been abused, neglected, abandoned, 
and a school. And uh, so keep, the, keep that team in your prayers. If you have gently used or new, we're looking for coats and shoes and, and some clothes. Uh, we have boxes around the building. You can bring those and drop them in. Don't, don't give anything that you wouldn't let your kids or grandkids wear, okay? This is not to get rid of your old stuff. This is good stuff. Coats in particular, because it actually gets cold down there. They're on the equator and they're really high uh, up altitude-wise, so it gets a little cold. Um, and we need those in the next couple of weeks. Well, when, John, when do we need those? Like now, right? Next week? This, this sun, next Sunday? Okay, by next Sunday. Bring those by next Sunday. Uh, dinner and Devo is a big deal for us every summer. We, we meet here at the building at 545, and we have food together. Uh, and then we have a, a devotional, and then we sit around and eat more food. And just it's a great time. Starts at 545. This Wednesday, you will need a ticket. Where will we be selling those tickets? Right out here? Shannon's going to be right over here in this lobby selling tickets. I think it's $7 for an adult and $4 for kids. And you can buy season passes or you can uh, buy them one at a time either way. So the food's always really, really good too. So be a part of that. Next Sunday morning, we start our new adult classes. Um, and there are, I think there are four or five different ones of them. You can go on our website, twickenham.org, click connect and click adult and that'll show you the classes that are available. They're also in the bulletin. If you're not getting our bulletin and you would like to receive it through email, call our church office. We'll set that up for you. And I think that's everything I needed to tell you other than if you need prayer this morning, if you need to talk to somebody about something going on in your life, some of our elders are gonna be down in S, the first room on the left. I forget the number, Um, but it's 102, 201, 201. S201, down here on the left, they will listen with you, they will pray with you, they will be there for you. Okay, Walton Harless is one of our elders. He has an announcement to make this morning, so give him your attention. What? There's a what? Oh, the summer kickoff parties next week with food. After church. I, I need a teleprompter or something, so... Summer kickoff party for our kids. The gym is going to be great. Come be a part of that. And if you want to help with that, we'd love for you to help with our kids too. Walton. Good morning, church. I'm Walton Harless. I'm one of the uh, shepherds here at Twickenham. I've been asked to make a statement on behalf of the shepherd team. Over the last several weeks, Lee Potts, also one of our shepherds, and Jody, our pulpit minister, they have led a combined adult class in a series on God's good design for male and female. We have looked at what that means for our relationship in the world, in the home, and in church. Our prayer is that this study has inspired us all to recommit ourselves to greater faithfulness, compassion, and unity. So given that teaching, We heard in the lessons in this series about male and female roles in the church, and through prayer and discussion, our prayer is to remain thoroughly within the Lord's guidance, but to avoid drawing lines that God did not intend. Therefore, based on our study of the scripture, certainly the roles of our shepherds and our preacher will continue to be limited to qualified males. But that same study leads us to affirm the freedom for our gifted sisters to offer prayers, communion meditations in our worship services, to direct our hearts in song and in praise, to make announcements, to share testimonies, and to extend the welcome at the beginning of our worship service. While we acknowledge the freedom of other churches to reach different conclusions, as a shepherd team, we believe that hearing the voices of our sisters will build up and will bless this church. Thank you very much. I'm going to lead in a prayer, and then we'll be dismissed. Heavenly Father, we are so thankful to be your your children, and we pray that we 
our children in the center of your will, that we are lights in this place, but especially in this town, in this city, and everywhere that we are working or that we interact with others. We, we pray for our lives to be centered in your will. We pray that we realize the importance of your commands to love others as we love ourselves. And we, we pray that that will be our heart. We pray that our love for you is, is supreme and that we look to be your children again in all things. We give you praise for this church. We give you thanks for the blessings that are ours here. We give you blessings for the, the way that you have provided for us. And Father, we just give you the praise and the thanks. In Jesus' name, amen.